to the AWS cloud with the AWS Storage Gateway. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante with Wikibon.org, and this is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's flagship production. We're here at AWS Summit in Moscone. I'm here with Jeff Frick, my co-host for the week. Jeff, it's really a pleasure working with you. West Coast guy with a tie on, I love to see it. I got the tie on for Dave. You know, my colleague John Furry usually goes, uh, no tie, but. Uh, so we're here with David Ward, Dave Ward, uh, Senior Manager of EC2 uh, at AWS. We're going to talk pricing. Uh, Amazon is really, as we've heard all week, we heard last year at reInvent, Amazon is very aggressive and proactive about dropping its prices, passing that on to the customer, but it's also innovative in the way it packages pricing. So, uh, Dave, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So let's talk about the different options. We were just talking uh, off, off camera about how, you know, one of our colleagues is moving into AWS and you had suggested maybe helping us out with some pricing models. So, yeah. what are my options as a customer? I'm new to AWS, what should I be looking for? So, in general, AWS has a pricing philosophy which is um, you want to pay for what you use. As you grow bigger, we want you to have reduced prices. And if you're able to commit, you can get even reduced prices. So that breaks into three main pricing models for EC2. The first is called on-demand. And on-demand really allows you to pay by the hour. Uh, so effectively, you can try out new instance types. You can try out a bunch of new uh, different services throughout EC2 uh, and only have a commitment of one hour. The second is reserved, where you pay a low one-time fee and then a much lower hourly fee associated with any of your usage. And then the final pricing model is spot, where you can bid on unused capacity uh, to leverage tens of thousands of machines or, um, uh, and also get pricing savings upwards of 90, 92% off the on-demand price. So help me understand when I should use each. It sounds like on-demand, for new, you want to do some experimentation, yep. reserve pricing, you start to get some more predictability in your business model pay a little more up front, and then spot is just opportunistic. Is that, is that right? Talk about that a little sure. bit. Sure, um, so typically what you see is with on-demand pricing, uh, it's people who are relatively new to AWS or who are uh, trying to benchmark new applications or uh, really have a lot of volatility in their pricing. Typically they're running between zero and 15% utilization over a one or three year period. Um, when you get to reserved instances, uh, a customer at that point has made a decision to um, to basically run on AWS and with that workload, uh, somewhere between 15 and 100% utilization uh, over the entire term, and they don't want their instances going away at all. They know that they have a certain load that they care about. Um, so think of your web application servers, think of your database servers, anything where you really want to make sure that it's around. When you get to spot instances, we really are talking about opportunistic computing. And what that means is that you typically have um, a couple different use cases. Two of the most common ones are where um, you have a certain baseline workload, which you're running on reserved instances, and you want to accelerate that workload by opportunistically adding more capacity, i.e. spot. Uh, alternatively, uh, you have a certain need by date when you need to get your, your workload done by, and it doesn't matter, the value of your, your, your data doesn't really change significantly before that need by date, and so you're able to delay it. And so that's another great time for spot. Pretty much most of the other opportunities are unreserved. Dave, you were talking about, just one more follow-up, and I know Jeff wants to jump in. Yep. You were talking about utilization, yep. uh, a, a range, a spectrum. Um, how are you measuring utilization? Can you just clarify that a little bit? Sure, in terms of utilization, what we want to look at is that one instance running 744 hours costs very differently for us than 744 instances running during one hour. Yeah. So when it comes down to it, utilization for us means that you're running uh, one instance every hour during the month and that would be 100% utilization. So 30% utilization would be effectively 30% of 744. Got it, okay. So I'm just curious, I thought I understood, but now I'm a little confused. What's it, so an on-demand is I need, I need horsepower, yep. and spot I need more horsepower. What's the difference between the two? 
So the best way of thinking of it is that spot, you basically go in there and bid for our unused capacity. So you set your bid price, the maximum you're willing to pay. And then we have a spot price, which is based on supply and demand. Um, since we're selling our unused capacity, that spot price will change over time. And uh, if the spot price is below the bid price, you get capacity. If it goes above, you lose that capacity. I don't get it. Okay. Uh, so we'll actually terminate your instances at that point. Okay. Um, on demand, if you acquire it, right, then it's you I got have it, it for right. It, it spins up, it goes. Yeah. So on the spot, am I buying unused capacity from Amazon, or am I buying unused capacity from Dave because he's not using it on his project that he uh, he's got reserve stuff? Unused capacity from Amazon. From Amazon, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can't arbitrage my I, th I thought it was capacity. a secondary uh, <laughs> secondary market, like uh, like the ticket brokers. So you talk about that. We actually have something called the Reserved Instance Marketplace. Right. And uh, the Reserved Instance Marketplace is, is where we have reserved instances that customers have purchased from Amazon, and they can buy and sell those. And so we talk about a secondary market. We actually have one of those, too. So you do have one. Okay. Yes. Uh, and that's the reason why that came into existence is that Customers were asking for more flexibility with reserved instances. And so, uh, at the end of the day, what they were really asking for was uh, a way of saying, my business suit has changed, I want to sell this excess one or get rid of it somehow, and then buy another one of another sort. It's so Dave, can you share with us, even in general terms, um, any data that you have from a customer perspective on how much money I can save in, in each of these models at scale? Yeah. So. Let's just start out with on demand. So depending on, uh, the best way of thinking about your cost savings and on demand is what is the peak amount of capacity that you would have had to purchase on premise? And if you were to run that the whole time, uh, that's what you would have to provision to meet your, your potential needs in terms of demand uh, versus only running that for one hour, right? And so, you know, the gamut there ranges significantly. Right. Um, so it's hard to throw around exact quotes on that one. On reserved, if we benchmark that against on-demand, uh, you can get upwards of 72% off the on-demand price. And for spot, typically on average, we see at least 80% savings. Um, however, we've seen upwards of 92% off the on-demand price. Okay, and, and then, um so you, then you mentioned the reserve instance marketplace. Mm -hmm. When did you guys launch that service? So we launched that, I believe it was July or August of last year. Of last year, yep. right, okay. And, and then that transaction as well goes through Amazon, of course, right? Correct. So, so I get the same sort of interface, pricing transparency, yep. everything else, it's not some, some new interface. What kind of traction is that getting? It's actually working out really well. It's meeting our internal goals. It's. Uh, in terms of the buyer side, we're seeing a lot of great selection out there, so you can find new new pricing terms and great uh, great selection in pricing. On the on the seller side, we're actually seeing, assuming that you price at a very competitive rate, we're seeing that um, you know reserved instances are rotating off that marketplace at a good churn. Is it is this stuff patentable? I mean, these, oh, yes. these so the the so what's patentable? The the methodology that you use to determine all this marketplace and transactions, or is it the concept itself, or both? Or so um, you know, there's the whole gambit of utility patents versus business methodology patents aren't really as patentable. There. Yeah, they're kind of fuzzy, right? And yeah. So um, a lot of this comes down to the utility type patents of how does spot work, how does reserved instance marketplace work, how do those interchange? And the actually. details behind it to make sure it's accurate and yep. fair, and, and so you guys obviously have filed and will continue to file patents in that area. It's actually a, you know, a great area uh, out there for us. There's a lot of white space um, for innovation, and so, um, you know, it's, it's a great place to be in terms of continuing to innovate and, and move the field forward, and so we hope to continue to kind of push that trend. Are you hiring people? Oh, I mean, we are hiring everybody's people. hiring, right? <laughs> what, what are you looking for? So on my teams, I'm looking for a great senior manager, um, someone that, uh, leveling at Amazon's a little weird. We have people that, I've had a senior vice president of a thousand plus person company work for me before. Uh, that, so senior directors and directors, like at most other companies, that's the level of person that I'm looking for to run Spots Engineering Org. Uh, I'm looking for principal engineers, so people that are uh, super experienced that are really excited about doing things in highly distributed, highly scalable computing, um, senior engineers, web developers, a product manager as well, so someone that's really, um, that has both a business and technology background. Um, so You're exploding. 
<laughs> we, we are hiring all over the place, and I would love to, to connect with anyone who's interested. Uh, so, Dave, you guys announced, uh, I guess it was in March, that you were giving away Trusted Advisor, I think for a month, to let people try it out. How much um, does Trusted Advisor get involved in recommending pricing? That's a great question. We've already made over $22 million uh, in recommendations on how to optimize costs. So people could save $22 million worth of uh, money just optimizing based on reserved instances. So it's one of those things where Trust is a great tool and, and we're going to continue to innovate in that direction of uh, helping customers to save money. So how's Trusted Advisor work? Like I say, you, you sort of did a freebie in March, if I, if I recall. That's right. And then now, now it's a service that I can, I can purchase, right? Correct. And then so the, the economic justification of purchasing that service is you're going to tell me how to save money and how to improve best practice. So it actually comes along free with uh, premium support. And so um, I believe it's enterprise and I forget, the, maybe it's developer support. And along with that, you get the Trusted Advisor service, which basically will perform a set of checks against uh, the service you're running, your resources and your money. Um, and what that comes down to is, are your resources idle? Um, can you optimize your resources based on reserved instances? Can you, um, any number of these checks. Are your security groups set up right? And all of our best practices we've been folding into the Trusted Advisor tool. And so, um, you know, our hope is to continue to expand that over time. And you can check it, you know, now, premium support, you mentioned premium support. Uh, you're, I presume you're involved in, in, in that pricing as well, or, or uh, not necessarily? Premium support, not, not No, okay, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not even going to ask you that then, but because uh, <laughs> I, I had sort of a detailed question there, but it's not fair if that's not your area. How about the, the Amazon TCO calculator? Do you have any visibility on that? I do have visibility. So that was interesting. I've been playing around with that quite a bit in the last several months, and uh, I have to say, I, I give you props because it's an honest calculator. And the reason I know it's an honest calculator is because you actually can make, for instance, since you can make on-premise servers more expensive. You, you, I think your storage pricing may be a little, little aggressive, a little high for the on-premise, so I think I could probably get some on the, on the spot market, market open, but in general, I found that calculator to be, and I, I would consider an honest calculator. It wasn't rigged. Yep. You know, a lot of these TCO calculators are just kind of phony. But, um, but that's a service that you put forth to people. Do people, act, are they actively using it? I mean, I know it's about lead gen and getting people to engage, but do people actually use that to make business cases? Definitely. So, a lot of what we're trying to do, the economics are there for uh, AWS to be a, um, to win against on-prem almost in, in every scenario. Um, so our goal is really just to provide the data to help people sell from within companies themselves. And so people are using the TCO calculators. People are really starting to build those, those use cases inside. In fact, uh, I've seen some people leverage tools like that. They say, this is broken. Over the weekend, they move to AWS and try something out, whether it's, there's a large enterprise, uh, uh, an airplane company that was running on us that uh, their testing app was broken. So over the weekend, someone did a big spot uh, spot trial, and like all of a sudden, they had a testing service that was working better than their provider. And uh, the next thing you know, like there's a enterprise salesperson, you know, going into the lobby, and they're like, "Shh, we haven't told anyone yet." Yeah. So, so this is classic Amazon. It's like self-service pre-sales. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then as shadow as, IT, <laughs> it works perfectly because by that time. Uh, you really develop that that trust that hey we are gonna really reduce the price and it was so low of a cost that they didn't even occur to them that that, that even anything was was changed right so so Dave let me shift gears just a little bit because we had a lot of people talking about kind of the culture it's a little different I grew up in Portland right so Seattle is Boeing right Boeing and Microsoft and Starbucks and and, and more and more Amazon right. So talk a little bit about what makes the culture special and why you guys are able to continue to execute in, you know, kind of extensions, 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 extensions into new areas. Yeah, um, so I think a lot of the difference in our culture comes down to uh, we have, the decision making process is really pushed down to each of the teams. So I'm effectively a mini general manager, so I can make many different decisions across the AWS motor market, uh, across reserved instances, and a number of other areas. And what that means is that we're able to operate very fast and very uh, ad in an agile fashion. Um, and so we have a lot of these teams moving in parallel. And any of the dependencies between teams tend to be, we try to cut those whenever possible so that people can move independently. Um, additionally, there's a, 
a huge culture around diving deep. And so what that means is that uh, as opposed to PowerPoint, PowerPoint's virtually been outlawed at Amazon. That's a good thing. Uh, so <laughs> instead we write Word documents that are these six-page, single-space papers right. uh, called narratives. Paragraphs. Uh, it's, uh, it makes you get down to the details, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, and uh, when you start to explain things in that way, it means that your ideas actually have to have roots to it. Yeah. Um, we also have a culture of what we call post-holing. And post-holing is this idea of have you ever climbed a mountain or anything of that nature? Yeah. So you actually more the ice axe usually than the post hole uh, yeah. digger. <laughs> so the post hole lets you at least know if there's some soft spots. Right. Out right. There. Okay. And so we, when we're reviewing these narratives, we can figure out are there soft spots? Have we really thought through the whole idea? Um, and you know, everyone sits around a table reading the narratives, and uh, you just read them during that meeting, and then you talk about them. And it's a very open culture where I've had documentation developers challenge you know a VP before and say, hey, I don't believe this is the right thing, and they had, you know. The really authority to really yeah. to uh, take that through. Awesome. Excellent. All right, Dave. Well, thanks very much for coming on the Cube. Interesting story. Really appreciate the uh, the insights, the pricing transparency, the the speed at which you guys continue to to, to push on on price the client. So congratulations on all the progress you made. Good luck on all those hires that you have to make. Appreciate We're, it. we're doing our part to spread the word. So uh, I really appreciate it. Really appreciate you coming on the Cube. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll be right back. Sajai uh, Krishnan is up. He's the general manager of the AWS Marketplace. You want to you hear this story. It's very interesting. So keep it right there. We're right back with theCUBE. Silicon Angle live at AWS Summit in Moscone. Right back. We good? We good? Uh, we out. Thanks Dave. so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Andre, let us know when we're out, okay? No, it's okay. Finding the right software. Sanjay, Dave Vellante. Dave, Sanjay, how are you? Sanjay, pleasure to meet you. Likewise.